Good evening all and welcome. They say that people are the real monsters that walk the earth, and after hearing these stories, I'm sure you'd be inclined to agree with me. Towards the end, I also have a few lighter stories to pick the mood up a little bit, should we say. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new here and download our app for over three and a half thousand stories to listen to. But for now, it's time to get comfortable, keep your knife safe, and let the darkness take control. My story is not about ghosts nor goblins, but something much worse. A man. Yes, a man who forced me to view humans from a totally different perspective. It's a long story, and I've never shared it with anyone, but I have mentioned it to my therapist, as this was a very traumatic experience. Even though this happened to me many years ago, it's important for me to give you as many details as possible, and a bit about myself. My name is Yvonne. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a female, Asian Hispanic. I know, lovely mix. At the time of this, I was in my 30s. I'm about five foot six and weighed 130 pounds. Athletic, fair-skinned, and was also newly divorced. I had embraced my newfound freedom. I must warn you though, my experience can be triggering as it contains many acts of violence, both domestic and sexual assault. So it's really up to you if you wish to proceed. Without further ado, I was going through a party phase, and my way of coping with life was by drinking and partying my life away. Yes, it temporarily numbed my emotions, but due to my selfish behavior, my young children suffered. I was young, but even then, I acted immature. I just wanted to have a good time. I wanted absolutely nothing serious with anyone. My recent divorce was hurting me so deeply, and when I liked someone, I would romance that person until they would be eating from my hand. But then, just like that, I wouldn't contact them again. But when someone showed too much interest in me, I did the very opposite. Yes, I pushed back harder. I had youth and beauty. I was in control, or so I thought. There was this very handsome man who was a friend of a friend's. This night, he happened to be the lucky one who apparently wanted more than to just dance the night away. As you may have guessed, I was most definitely pushing him back, but I had my reasons this time. The last time I had seen this guy, he made comments that made me dislike him even more. You will be mine, he would jokingly tell me. I would respond flirtatiously, yet joking. Victor, it doesn't hurt to dream. I saw anger in the deep of his big brown eyes, but I promised myself he would get nothing but my pity. And I jokingly said, I'd rather be dead. Victor replied in a firm voice, that can be arranged, followed by laughter from him, but also everyone who was there at the party. They thought it was funny too. Then one of Victor's friends said, almost threateningly, you know, Victor always gets what he wants. With my liquid courage out loud, I said, I belong to no one. And just to be clear, I'm the one who does the picking and choosing. Feeling slutty, my friends laughed in agreement. Finally, party night had arrived. The plan was for the three couples to all go together, males and females paired respectively. But when I got picked up, to my dismay, guess who I'd been paired with? You guessed it, Victor, who also happened to be the person driving us in his brand new red truck. I knew it was a conspiracy, but I wasn't gonna back down. I was ready for the challenge. We decided to go to a very fancy club and Victor was being a total gentleman from what I could tell. The lights were bright, the music was bumping, and the alcohol was flowing. I felt alive. And tonight was all about me. I realized at one point that I needed to go to the ladies' room. It was there that I assessed my current situation and concluded that I would slow down on the drinking. It wasn't even midnight, and I could already feel the effects, which was odd because not only was my head spinning, but I would feel terribly sleepy. I also didn't want to drink any more, so I could keep my composure and not do something I would regret. But I was feeling sleepy. There was a point 
where I almost thought I would fall asleep while standing by the sink washing my hands. At the time, I didn't even realize I hadn't finished up my Jack and Coke. This feeling was new, so now it was a matter of survival. I stormed out of the bathroom to find the girls I came with. I wanted to be near them in case I collapsed, but my steps were getting heavier, as were my eyelids. Then I realized the drink. As I stumbled into the crowd, barely keeping my eyes open, I saw Victor standing there with a grin on his face. He was tall at six foot two, 250 pounds with brown hair and beautiful dreamy brown eyes. His teeth were perfectly white and straight. He was walking towards me and as he got closer, I wanted to yell, you drugged me, you coward. Then I felt my legs give out, but I don't remember hitting the floor. I really don't know how long I was out. I opened my eyes to the humming of a ceiling fan and the cool air hitting my bare body. The first thought was to quickly sit up and find my clothes, but for the time being, I couldn't move. I was able to move my eyes, but my entire body was numb. I began questioning myself. Who did I leave the club with? Where am I? Whose living room was I lying in? I wanted my clothes, but how could I find it if I couldn't even move my hands? Suddenly I heard footsteps and a familiar voice. You awake? It was Victor. How could he ask so calmly? I wanted to say many obscenities, but my voice wasn't cooperating. It was gone. I realized I was lying butt naked on my adversary's couch. When I realized he was also naked. No. How could this be happening? I was defenseless, pinned to the couch and unable to scream or run. I was Victor's prey, and he was going to have his way with me while holding me hostage. My own body had betrayed me. I was so thirsty, but I wanted nothing Victor had to offer. Sadly, I didn't have a choice. As he grabbed my hair and sat me up on the couch, he got a styrofoam cup and poured a bitter, clear liquid in my mouth. And at the same time, he was holding a knife to the side of my throat and screamed at me to drink. The tip of his pocket knife was so sharp, it was best to cooperate. I was being violated in so many ways. I needed to use the bathroom badly, and somehow it seemed as if he read my mind. He dragged me off the couch and threw me to the floor and had the balls to kick me twice in the ribs. Then, with a closed fist, punched me in the face several times. I could feel the blood flowing from my nose and into my mouth and immediately felt a lot heavier. He pointed towards the bathroom and I began to slowly crawl in his direction. I knew I was probably not going to make it out of there alive, but I couldn't understand why he hated me so much. But what about my children? What would happen to them? There was women's underwear and children's toys scattered all over the wooden floor. I grabbed a moist towel from the floor, noticing that neither my clothes nor purse were in sight. Then I heard a phone vibrating. I quickly located it. There it was, a beautiful flip phone. As soon as I opened it, I dialed 911 immediately. I began digging around the bathroom for any information that I could provide to emergency services. They answered, asking what my emergency was. I let the dispatcher know that it wasn't a prank call, that I had been kidnapped, drugged, raped, and brutally beaten by a man. I gave the address I had found on a prescription bottle label in the medicine cabinet. I was in Gilbert, Arizona. I was trying my best to give the best description of Victor, when quickly he tears down the bathroom door. I'm greeted with a fist across my jaw, causing me to stumble and hit my head at the edge of the sink. My heart sank as the flip foam went flying across the floor. I'm losing consciousness, trying to protest from drinking whatever he's forcing down my throat, but obviously I don't have a choice, because what I hear next just confirmed that I was very much dead. A click. I knew what it was. It was a firearm. I felt the cold barrel of the 9mm that was against my temple. I could feel the warm blood dripping down into my chest from my face. And then Victor said the following. You called the cops. We have to go now. Besides, I need to get rid of you, because my wife and kids will be home soon. I could barely stay awake. So Victor tried to drag me by the hair. But it was taking too long and he lost his patience. He proceeded to drag me by the arm 
from the third floor. As he exited the door, he grabbed me, threw me over his shoulder, and was trying to get me in the truck. But somehow, I was fighting him. I figured he was going to kill me anyway. I might as well fight this deranged, evil man. I was screaming, biting, kicking, and scratching. But I couldn't see because my eyes were closed shut from injuries. But I imagined he needed the gun to shoot me. Then, go throw my body in the desert. Then I heard the police sirens and people coming out of their apartments to hear the commotion and I begin screaming that he's going to kill me in both English and Spanish. As multiple police cruisers came closer, Victor threw my body into the apartment complex garbage bin and peeled off. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. I needed sutures in many parts of my body. I had a dislocated shoulder, a broken nose, multiple head injuries, many lacerations, and my body was full of bruises. According to the ER doctor, the toxicology report showed five different types of drugs, but my alcohol was below the legal limit. You might be wondering what happened to Victor. I saw him when I was able to testify in court. There were two other women who came forward with their testimonies and gave Victor an additional five years on top of the eight he got for the crimes he committed against me. Victor whispered a threat when he got sentenced, something that no victim wants to hear. Someday, I'll get out and I'll hunt you down and finish the job. Listeners, please be cautious, especially if you're going out drinking. Stay with a trusty group of friends, and please keep an eye on your drink and theirs. When in doubt, listen to your gut. This experience changed me. I stopped drinking many years ago and have major trust issues. I cannot emphasize it enough. Always be aware of your surroundings. I have a pretty disturbing story to share. It all starts in December of 1993. I was living in Aurora at the time. It was around 9 p.m. and I had just finished my martial arts class and was waiting outside for my mum to pick me up from the school. My martial arts school was in a smaller shopping center near a well-traveled intersection on the west end of Aurora near Denver. Adjacent to my school in the same parking lot was a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant. It usually closed around the time my class got out, but occasionally some of us would go and play video games or get breadsticks while we waited for class to begin. This particular evening it wasn't terribly cold. It was mid-December, but the winters in Colorado can be somewhat mild. I was still pumped from class, and I was running around the parking lot with another one of the kids from my class. We were distracted, so we did not see the figure enter Chuck E. Cheese. It was the loud popping noise coming from the building that got our attention. Before we could grasp what was happening, a kid came running out of the restaurant with a gun in his hand. He practically ran right into us. The next thing I know, he's pointing it at my face. He just stood there for a minute. It was like time froze. I could not take my eyes off the barrel, and all I could think of was this was probably the last thing I wanted to see in the world. After what seemed like a long time, but was probably a few seconds, I looked past the gun at his face. He wasn't even looking at me, he looked scared. I can see his finger on the trigger and wasn't sure if he was gonna pull it or not. I was frozen and could not have stopped him if he was. Instead, he turned and ran without a word. I watched him go, glued to the ground, amazed that I was still alive. He took off around the side of the building and was gone. My classmate and I just sat on the pavement. Neither of us said anything. Eventually, my mum showed up to give me a ride. I'm sure she was curious why I was acting funny, but I could not bring myself to tell her what happened. As far as I know, she still doesn't know to this day. I did not sleep that night. The next morning, I heard people in school talking about what happened. The kid's name was Nathan Dunlap. He murdered four people I know personally in cold blood, and critically wounded another. He had ditched the gun in an attempt to escape. That led to his arrest and eventual conviction. He was to be executed earlier this year for the crime, but was given a stay by the governor of Colorado. Having known that he had killed those people, I believe he would have killed us too. I'm not sure what distracted him that night, but I'm grateful. My family knows I was there that night. I don't think they know the extent of my involvement. 
I was never questioned about it, and until now, have never really volunteered any information about it at all. But I am now, because some things you learn to let go of. I don't know how much you know about him or what he did, but for a recap, the kids he killed were my age at the time. I didn't find out the extent of what he did until the next day, when I was face to face with him. At that time, I did not know he had just killed four people. He looked right at me, but I don't think he saw me. He looked more scared than I was, and I was the one with the gun in their face. I don't know if he should have gotten executed. He claims now that he has found God or whatever in prison, and that he's a different person. Perhaps it's true, perhaps it's not. It will never change the fact he executed four children in cold blood over nothing. He is where he belongs, and I'd almost rather see him have him live out the rest of his days reliving what he did, instead of getting the easy way out. This is what happened to me this month. I woke up one morning to a nail in my tire. Great. I looked for the nearest repair shop and made my way there. I was very happy to find a place that wasn't by appointment and was within five blocks from my apartment. When I got there, I was greeted by a nice looking man in a suit. He was shorter than me, had a very short beard and was covered in tattoos. I mean, he had full sleeves and some of his head. He wasn't one of those bad looking tattooed covered guys though. Anyway, they seemed to work for him. His name was Jake. I told Jake about my plans for my car and my future in the mechanic field. These were all my usual topics for small talk. His eyes lit up and he said if I ever wanted any hands-on experience, he would be happy to teach me. He wrote his name on a business card and handed it to me. I had worked in a shop previously, but the boss was old, horribly sexist and outright scary. I had guessed that Jake was in his late twenties to early thirties and I was so excited because he was young. It's not common to see people that are young that are the boss and I went home and told my boyfriend all about my experience. I thought about it for a few days, and then called and offered to work Wednesday mornings in the shop. The first Wednesday was uneventful. I watched one of the mechanics work all day and didn't learn anything that I didn't already know. Jake kept checking on me during the day and gave me his personal number so that I could contact him without having to go through the shop landline. The next Wednesday started off like a blast, the first hour I just watched the same tech, Jake came into the shop and asked me if I wanted to run some errands with him. Of course I said yes, because it was hot. I was wearing jeans and I knew the van could have air conditioning. Jake is the kind of guy that rambles a lot, so we went through topics really fast. We talked a lot about business at first, but then it got really weird. He started talking about the girls he was hooking up with and living with his ex. It didn't really faze me because this is how most of the boys in the industry talk. He bought me food and on our way back home, gave me a $20 bill for coming on his errands. He started leaving subtle comments about my boyfriend and that he should be giving me money, buying me stuff, and that I shouldn't rush into marriage because I was so young. Come Friday, I was extremely bored and didn't want to do my schoolwork. So I texted Jake to see if I could come hang out at the shop even though I wasn't wearing shop clothes. I was wearing a semi-long skirt and a long crop top. When I got there, he said, do you wanna make some money today? I said, yeah, and he led me to the back office. It was slow that day, so I was just doing odd jobs around the office and reception desk. He kept saying how much he liked my skirt, which I would like to add showed nothing. Okay, weird. Throughout the day, I kept catching Jake staring down my skirt. Men will be men, I thought. He kept commenting on my outfit, saying things like, I didn't know you were hiding all that under your shop clothes. Your skirt's gonna make it hard for me to stand up in a minute. At this point, I was just trying to get the job done so that I could make money and go home. and was starting to get really nervous as the comments escalated. God, it makes me wonder what else you're hiding under there. I responded, Jake, I have a boyfriend which he definitely knew. That's when he said, and I quote, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to put it in you, but 
like, can I see? Anger bubbled up in me, and I yelled, No, you can't speak to me like that. I finished my job to get a whopping $30. Great, all that for nothing. The next morning, Jake called me and told me that his boss came by the shop and got in trouble for having me there. So he told me I shouldn't come back for a while. I was heartbroken and confused. A week went by and I was having trouble sleeping. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Was I really fired for being a liability? Or was it because I said no to him? I called Jake on Sunday and asked. He promised me that I wasn't fired because I said no to him and said that he would have told me if he'd fired me for that reason. Then began ranting and talking about how he went to prison and doesn't play games like that. I told him that what he had said to me made me feel really uncomfortable. And he went on to say that I could still go and hang out whenever I wanted. He was talking about a coffee shop nearby and a restaurant and was like he was trying to get me to come out with him. After he fired me? Okay, weird. Like, did you not just hear what I said? That night as I was trying to fall asleep, I felt this overwhelming need to check the Megan's Law website. In California, we have a website that shows all registered sex offenders. All that I knew was his name and the town he lived in. I must have read about 300 profiles when a face caught my attention. His face. I shook as I clicked on the profile which read, Conviction 2008, released 2010. Offense, lewd or lascivious acts with a child under 14. Jake was 20, the child was under 14. Jake was a freaking child molester, but it didn't stop there. I panicked and went down the rabbit hole finding pages and pages of criminal charges dating all the way back to 2005. He had been arrested a lot of times and done really horrible things. There were reports of stabbing, fights, gang-related offences, and obviously, child molestation. I can't believe I got in the car with him alone. I worked with him alone. I've talked to him. How did I not know? I'm really glad that I got away from him when I did. I've never been more happy to have been fired in my life. So, with that being said, Jake, let's never meet again. My name is Yvonne. I'm a female in my 50s. I'm five foot six, a bit on the heavy side, and have limited use of my hands, but hide it well. Presently living in the state of Arizona, and throughout the years have encountered many creepers, and due to my friendly demeanor, I seem to attract them like a magnet. I can make small talk with just about anyone. I show no fear, and I walk with confidence. For these same reasons, I'm not afraid to tell anyone phrases such as, please back away, you're making me uncomfortable, and I'm not interested. You've been warned, but my favorite phrase is, don't come any closer because I'm armed. I could say that I have trained myself for any kind of encounter. Every month I drive across town to visit my clinic doctor, as I must receive a much needed medication, and my last visit was scheduled for mid-morning, which is when the clinic's lobby is at full capacity. I arrived and parked in the front of the clinic, which is a one-level building with two main entrances facing east. I make it a habit to always do a quick scan of my surroundings before I exit my car. I like to check for any immediate danger before I put myself in a vulnerable position. On my keychain, I carry a whistle, a small knife, a screwdriver, pepper spray, and my panic button, all in miniature size. I'm old and frail, but I'm not going down without a fight. No, I'm not an aggressive person. You might think I'm overly prepared, and maybe I am, but if you've noticed, it's a violent world we live in, and people like me are targets just about anywhere. I noticed that at one of the clinic entrances there was a man of about six foot four, maybe 300 pounds, with a long, unkempt beard and tobacco-stained moustache. He appeared homeless, and I have nothing against the homeless. We're all human, after all, but I figured if he's standing by one entrance, I would enter through the other, to avoid him, at least being 12 feet away from him. I began walking towards the door, and this man started to approach me halfway towards the entrance. He then stretched out his hand and said in a southern accent, Name's Jake, little lady. I didn't shake his hand, but did say hello. He went on to say that he'd seen me before, but forgot my name. As he said this, he tried to block my path. 
I replied, telling him I'd never seen him before, but it was nice to meet him, and if he could excuse me, because I was late for my appointment. He then quickly added, if I could take him down the street to Circle K. It wasn't a request, it was a command. I don't think so, Jake, I replied. As I began walking away, I heard him grumble in colourful words. He was talking about how I could just walk away from him. She thinks she can just make fun of Jake and walk away. Yes, he was in fact referring to himself in the third person. I pretended not to hear him, but I knew not to let my guard down because this man was on a mission. And that had me shaking inside. The clinic's lobby was packed, and for a moment I felt safe. I signed in and made my way to sit next to an exit door, still on high alert. Then everything happened so quickly. I pulled out my Samsung Galaxy earbuds and set up Spotify to listen to my favourite podcast, and put the volume on low. I saw Jake approach me, and I felt my heart skip a beat, but I remained cool and collected. Give me your earbuds. I turned off my podcast, put my earbuds away, and slowly stood up. At this point, his voice was louder. I said, give me your earbuds. I don't think so. He then took a step closer, and by now he was aware that I was armed. I was going to defend myself. I gave this man a last warning, and to both our misfortune, he didn't comply. Jake takes two big steps, and then sprints towards me as if he was a football player and he was going to tackle me. I screamed and prepared for impact. I knew I was no match for this man. I managed to pepper spray him all over the face, causing him to go down. As he was falling, he attempted to drag me to the ground with him, as he's screaming in pain. He begins pulling me away, and as I'm looking for the exit I sat next to, I notice two people coming in and seeing the action. They froze in place, blocking my exit, and they got pepper spray residue. All the people just stood and videotaped the incident. The staff alerted security and contacted the authorities. I wasn't going to be taken down by this monster, so I basically put all 170 pounds on his back. As I was screaming like a maniac, security finally came and handcuffed Jake. Fortunately, I wasn't hurt, but I was rattled and couldn't stop shaking. Afterwards, I went to the bathroom and cried like a child. My heart goes out to people who were not mentally stable either by choice or by lack of resources. To Jake, if you're listening, you must have thought that I wasn't scared of you, but honestly you terrified me, and I've had nightmares of you since we met. I don't plan on using the rest of my miniature weapons, but I wouldn't think twice to defend myself. So, Jake, for your own sake, let's not meet. This happened around 2002. I moved to Belfast from London, and I would have been about 11. I'm 30 now. I lived in a new area. A lot of houses were being built, and they were all massive and beautiful houses despite being a terrible area, which I thankfully no longer live in. I'm with a friend called Dave. We're looking for my sister, and we go around the corner from my house, where they are building a bunch of houses, and it's pretty dark. I'd probably say it's like 10 or 11 p.m. I don't really remember why we were actually looking for my sister. I don't even think she was around. We were walking past houses that looked pretty much finished. We're chatting and a guy randomly shows up out of the blue behind us, grabs a hold of me. Dave, by this stage, is batshit petrified and runs away crying and climbs over a fence. He completely ditches me. The guy is very casual despite being creepy and I'm not as freaked out as I should be. I assume he's a Pruvy, which is someone who watches the streets in West Belfast. He's got a hold of me, and it's like when you've been caught in a place you shouldn't be in. I expect him to just be like, you shouldn't be here at night while we're patrolling the streets. But suddenly we go to a house which isn't completely built yet, and nobody lives in it. I'm standing outside this basement looking house while he's outside phoning the cops. I assume he's fake calling them. The conversation sounds fake, like he's just trying to scare me. And this is where I really get freaked out now. Because on the upstairs, there's this constant tapping sound. It can't be a builder because it's 11pm. It sounds like someone is locked inside something and trying to get out. That scared me. It was the speed of the sound, and as if they knew I was in the house. 
It sounded like they were trapped upstairs or something. Suddenly he's off the phone and he's like, okay, the cops are coming to your house soon, leave now. And I'm thinking, nah, not really. I didn't give you my address. But at the same time I was freaking out because maybe this guy knows the streets and where I live. So that entire night, I was just looking out my window hoping no cops would come by and they didn't in the end. And he obviously did all that just to scare me. But why? This situation for me is frightening because a random guy grabbing a hold of you in the street in the pitch darkness is freaky, regardless or not whether it's a building site, despite the fact I probably shouldn't have been there. He could have put me in a room and locked the door, had someone torture me or something. I've always wondered like why he was there, what he was doing. Afterwards, I was scared to go out at night in the area, unless I had someone accompany me. Truth be told, there were a lot of issues in the area, and I'm guessing that guy was like a bunch of other guys that were just acting like undercover police, since they aren't usually comfortable coming to where I live, since they'd usually get bricked. It comes from the troubles. Looking back though, I think the entrance was blocked off and we weren't actually allowed there. Considering the situation, I was actually pretty calm compared to my friend and I have terrible anxiety. I think I just assumed this guy wasn't bad, but again, on any given day, he could have been bad, really. I'd recently gone back to my home state for a visit after roughly a year and a half away. I caught up with a few friends on my first night and shot the breeze of dinner and billiards. I come to find my friend Tony has changed his mind about attending community college and decided to try his hand at pursuing a childhood dream instead. He didn't really get into much detail at the time. As a matter of fact, the conversation started towards the end of the night. I made it a point to mention that I needed to go and rent a hotel room. Tony wasn't having it. Nope. I'd be a pretty crap friend if I let you drive off right now. I'm only three miles away, and I converted my old bedroom into an office and guest sleeping area after my brother moved out. Save your cash. Tony and I had been friends since the seventh grade. As a matter of fact, we're still friends to this day. Like me, he was a quiet kid, at least at first. His uncle worked at our old school as a teacher's aide, and I overheard them talking about a mutual interest one day. Classic punk rock. I was doing my best not to eavesdrop, but then they started talking about the damned. I joined in on the conversation, and that's how he became one of my closest friends in the world. So back to the evening at hand, I accepted his offer and followed him back to his house. We must have sat up for another three hours, just reminiscing before I crashed for the night. I got off the following morning and am greeted by the smell of fresh coffee and blueberry muffins. Tony asks me how I slept and I told him pretty well and pulled myself a mug of hot bean water life elixir. So do you have plans for today? You mentioned you only have today and tomorrow off work. I look at Tony and sip my coffee. I was thinking of going down to Wildwood or possibly Ocean City. Figured I'd check out the old stomping grounds and see whatever Gateway 26 has to offer. Tony nodded and took a bite of his muffin. Sounds like a plan. You think you could be back this way around five? He said while producing a ticket from his shirt pocket. He handed it to me, and it was for some indie wrestling show at Moose Lodge. I eyed down the piece of paper and thought about it for a minute. Sure, could be fun. I folded the ticket up and placed it within my wallet. After finishing breakfast, I wrote down the directions Tony gave me, and... Then I made my way to the boardwalk. Knowing I would have to be up at his at five, I opted to go to Ocean City. After enjoying some time at the arcades and devouring a few slices of heavenly pizza, I killed some time just meandering and taking in the sights. It was close to half past three when I made my way back to my car and made the journey to Moose Lodge. Upon arriving, I looked all over the place for Tony to no avail. I figured maybe I'd arrived a little too early, so I pulled the ticket out of my wallet and handed it to the lodge employee, tending to the front door. I get inside and begin looking around the crowd. There were perhaps 50 people. I have been to a few of these indie shows, and I can honestly say the crowd turnout has always been relatively small. This was one of the smallest. As I'm surveying my surroundings, I see it. The back of a wheelchair absolutely plastered in punk band stickers. In it, an older gentleman in his late 40s or early 50s, with bleach, blonde, billy idle hair and a leather jacket, 
loaded with pyramid studs and punks not dead, airbrushed on the back. Uncle Frank! I yell at the top of my lungs. The man in the wheelchair looks at me and shoots me an ear-to-ear -ear grin. Get your butt over here and give your uncle a hug. When you're done, cop and squat right here. He pointed to the chair on his left. I made my way over to Frank and he gave me a hug so tight he damn near dropped my back. I took my seat and asked him if he'd seen Tony. He said he was around here somewhere and that he thought he'd gone to grab some cheesesteaks from the concession. As if the timing couldn't be any more perfect, Tony sat down at the chair to the right of his uncle and handed me the thing I planned to make my dinner later on tonight. We sat there watching some good independent talent shows. Lots of flippy stuff on the ropes, tons of crowd interaction. They really wanted to make sure the crowd got their money's worth. When the show was approaching its second hour, it happened. Now I don't remember the wrestler's name. I could tell you he looked like King Kong Bundy with a mullet. He stood roughly six foot tall, and he was well over 300 pounds, an absolute mountain of a man. His opponent was some kid that was maybe 21 years old, and looked like he weighed 170 pounds soaking wet. The mountain man threw him around the ring like a training dummy, and proceeded to beat the ever-loving living hell out of him throughout the insanely short match before leveling him with what looked like a rock bottom from the second rope. One, two, three, the match was over. Obviously this man was playing the part of the heel, and boy was he getting into it. He climbed out of the ring and proceeded to talk smack to the crowd, even getting a few people's faces. But when he got to Tony, the mood completely changed. Things stopped being entertaining. Now if you'll humor me for a moment, let me just say I stand at five foot nine, and at the time I weighed 180 pounds. I'm not a big guy, never have been, and certainly don't look my age. This was probably my one and only saving grace. This guy gets in Tony's face, and he shot the big guy a look back before telling him to go piss off. Big guy takes offense, slapped Tony's disposable cup of Dr. Pepper out of his hand, splashing it all over his uncle in the process. Tony goes over the makeshift guardrail. He then rips off Tony's shirt and starts and start lighting up his chest and back with open-handed overhand chops. Everything's in slow motion at this point, and I get the bright idea to hop the guardrail and punch this guy in the back of the head. Everything went quiet and I zeroed in on his expression, on his face, as he turned his attention to me. This is how I die, was the most prevalent thought in my head at the time. Before anything could happen, I felt two hands go under my armpits and grasp my shoulders. Security began dragging me out. As I looked down towards Tony and Frank, they were yelling something I couldn't make out. The security guard looked at me and told me point blank I was lucky. I was a kid, otherwise he would have let the wrestler get a few good shots on me. I told the guard I would stay outside my car, but I wanted to make sure my friends were okay. They told me that would be fine as I waited and waited and waited. People began making their way to their cars and driving off as the show was over. I was looking all around for Tony, but didn't see him. Finally, I see Frank wheeling his way through the door with a look on his face. I couldn't quite pinpoint what it was supposed to mean. It was something between bewilderment and fighting the urge to laugh. Well, you know how to melt this old New York punk's heart. You got your ass kicked out there trying to take on the equivalent of human Godzilla. I'd say you have a death wish, but I know why you did it. Proud of you, man. Frank patted me on the arm, and I asked him where his nephew was. Tony's fine, he hit his head, he should be out any minute. I nodded at Frank, and watched his expression change to one of horror. As I turn around, I see the wrestler I donkey punched. His GMC Jimmy was parked next to my car. He grabbed me by the jacket and pushed me against his vehicle while winding me up to give me a receipt. At this point, I close my eyes and accept it. Much like a fly hitting a windshield, the last thing to go through my mind was going to be my ass, as this man punched it through my colon. I braced myself for impact, and then it happened. It was like a raindrop hitting me in the face. I opened my eyes to see Tony standing next to this shaven Sasquatch, and they're both busting a gut. That's how you throw a worked punch. And he lets go of my jacket and brushes me off. 
Tony then explained to me he had been there since two working with the large man, I now know as Mike. They planned out the whole thing. Mike was Tony's trainer, and this evening was supposed to be a storyline beating that would lead to Tony's first ring-in match in about a month's time, for those of you keeping score. Tony was what is known as a plant in the sports entertainment, and yet he forgot to tell me this whole ordeal would happen. Maybe he was just trying to help sell the moment. Maybe he genuinely forgot, but I honestly can't say. That was one of my brightest moments. Tony followed his childhood dream for a little while. I'd like to say about four years, but unfortunately indie wrestling shows don't really pay the bills and they take a huge toll on your body. Today he works as a 911 dispatcher. Occasionally we talk about his wrestling days and glance over it every now and again. Mike, you human horror movie with a weird sense of humour. Should we ever meet again, I honestly hope you buy me a drink after all that. And thank you for not turning my innards into outards. Just dumb kid stuff, right? Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I, um, I usually get, I think Let's Not Me is probably one of the topics that I get a lot of uh, stories about. I've used a lot up recently, I'm, I'm actually nearly out. But that's not what I was trying to say. What I've been meaning to say is that I've had um, the wrestling story is really good. In my opinion, it, um, you know, the whole setup and everything. I really like it. And I thought I, I really wanted to end with that story because it, I just, I just felt like it was the right story to end with. You know, something that you think is going to go down really badly, but it just turns out to be an elaborate prank. Um, I hope it lightened the mood. When I read it, it lightened my mood, especially after reading these dark stories. <sighs> yes, some of them were, well, pretty, pretty disturbing. Uh, if you enjoyed today's video, you can let me know. And if you're new here and are listening to me talk like this, then you can subscribe and stick around for more content and stuff. That's always fun. I really hope you did like today's video, though. I think we're going to have some ghost stories on Thursday, if all goes to plan, which should be fun. Big contrast from uh, people being horrors. Now we can have um, dead people being horrors instead. Uh, maybe. Maybe I'll put a poll out. We'll wait and see, isn't it? All right, then, guys. I'd like to end the video by giving a huge thank you to everyone who donates a tiny amount of money every month to help keep the channel running. The names of these amazing people are on screen. It's done via Patreon and um, YouTube membership and stuff and coffee. And if this is something that you'd like to do, give your money to Mort so that he can keep making content, uh, you can do that. But obviously it's completely optional. Subscribing is also nice, by the way. And tuning in three times a week, if you want. I'm going to wrap things up here. I'm hoping to see you on Thursday, and I wish you a great week ahead. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.